Dr. Jones, take us back to when you first started doing IVF. What obstacles did you face? I guess it depends on what you mean by the beginning. Because, you know, I was first involved with IVF 45 years ago, while I was still at Johns Hopkins. And my involvement there was with uh, Robert Edwards, who came to Hopkins as a fellow because he became interested in trying to fertilize human eggs in Great Britain, in Cambridge, but he could not get any eggs. And so he wrote to a friend of his, Victor McCusick, who at that time was head of the division of uh, medical genetics, and Bob was a geneticist, and they knew each other from international meetings. And asked uh, Victor if he could come to Hopkins, could he get some human eggs? So um, Victor called me and I said, sure, send him along, because at that time, a wedge resection of the ovary, taking a piece of ovary, was the standard treatment for an ovarian condition called polycystic ovarian disease. So we had plenty of ovarian tissue. And it was in the summer of uh, 1965 that I first attempted to, uh, with Bob, of course, to fertilize a human egg. And indeed, uh, I think we did succeed in achieving the first human egg fertilization at Johns Hopkins at that time. Interestingly enough, the uh, scientific publication that came from that had as its title, Attempts at Fertilizing, because the state of the art then was that in order to claim fertilization, it was thought that you needed to identify the sperm tail in the egg. And we couldn't f ever find a sperm tail, although we did find what's called pronuclei. Therefore, at that time, we did not claim mm -hmm. fertilization. But in retrospect, uh, pronuclei are quite adequate signs of uh, fertilization. And indeed, there are, in that article I mentioned, some photomicrographs of eggs with pronuclei in them. So I think, in truth, um, we did achieve fertilization at that time. I think your question, though, implied the clinical IVF. Well, what obstacles and difficulties did we have then? That's really quite a long story. <laughs> uh, I will give you an abbreviated version. Okay. Uh, but uh, we started it in Norfolk. Uh, without any thought that there would be any concerns or problems on anybody's part, it was indeed an extension of what my wife Georgiana and I w had been doing for many years, i.e. taking care of um, infertile patients. And this was just another step that became available. It had uh, been successfully done by Bob uh, in uh, Great Britain a couple of years before. In fact, from Norfolk, I called him up and congratulated him on this, and we had maintained contact through the years. So I was quite aware of everything that he was doing. When we were about to start, the uh, director of the hospital here, where we were going to do the stimulation and, and the retrievals and the transfers, called and said he thought it would be necessary to get a certificate of need, which was required at that time for all new procedures. But he said, uh, there won't be any problem. There's, there's no other program, and this is already a routine. You don't even need to bother coming, and, and uh, I'll let you know about it. Well, as it turned out, the um, agenda for the meeting apparently was in the paper because uh, when the... Uh, hearing occurred, uh, there were a large number of protesters that came. I wasn't even in town. I was happened to be in Baltimore at the moment. Uh, so when I came back, I discovered that uh, the hearing individual had said that he could not grant the um, oh. re request for a certificate of need because of the objections that were carried on. He did say, though, that it would be possible to reapply uh, if uh, the, uh, the hospital wanted to do that, 
uh, but through a public hearing route rather than an administrative route, which was a sort of a shortcut that had been tried before. And indeed, there was a hearing. It was held on Halloween Day of uh, 1979. Mm. And it lasted for eight hours. Oh, my goodness. And the three, uh, then the three uh, national television groups were there. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary to go into the details, but this illustrates the sort of difficulty we had. Uh, in fact, the certificate of need was granted after that hearing and after two or three other hearings. So uh, from, the be from the beginning, we did run into considerable opposition, chiefly from the right to lifers, who felt that we were causing abortion by the in vitro process. Did any of those challenges ever give you pause in terms of not continuing to pursue this medical treatment? N not at all, but I'll tell you what we did do. When we found that there was uh, a great deal of difficulty, I asked to go before the Board of Trustees of the medical school and the Board of Trustees of the hospital. And I said to them that I was surprised at the reaction that had occurred, that uh, we hadn't gotten into this far enough to uh, um, not be able to back out. And if they had any problem with it, we would back out and do something else. And interestingly enough, uh, both boards unanimously said to go ahead. Great. So I felt that our rear was secure, so to speak, and we uh, went ahead with the uh, procedure, but continued to have uh, difficulties, and not difficulties, we tend to have obstructions. There would occasionally be a picket line, and we'd have to cross the picket line, the patients and uh, the doctors. So that uh, public acceptance was not immediate and uh, general. So thinking about that breakthrough and the work that you did here, did you have any feeling or idea of the impact you were going to have on reproductive medicine? Uh, I, I think so, uh, because uh, at the time uh, this started, if a couple with infertility came to an expert, there was a 50% chance uh, even using artificial insemination, that you, the problem could be solved, only 50%. There was obviously uh, room for a great deal of improvement, and it seemed that IVF would offer that, although I must say, I didn't think that it would be as completely successful as it has been. So let me ask you this. What do you think being a leader in this field really means? Well, uh, I'll start with a negative in a way. Um, I've been concerned that um, I was responsible for some of the complications that occurred. I'm thinking particularly of multiple pregnancies. Uh, multiple pregnancies are undesirable. Mm -hmm. uh, most uh, twins and most triplets are perfectly normal. But there is a measurable difference between twins on a statistical basis and singletons. And as you get multiple pregnancies, the difficulties with the neonates uh, increase. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I felt some responsibility in doing what I could to uh, overcome the problems uh, that we were causing uh, with in vitro fertilization. But I must add, that uh, in vitro fertilization is not the principal cause of multiple pregnancies uh, in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, the principal cause is ovulation induction. And so that if the problem is going to be solved, something has to be done with ovulation induction as well as with uh, in vitro fertilization. Think about those 7.3 million Americans who are diagnosed with infertility right now in our country. What message do you have for them? As I indicated before, before IVF started, there was only a 50% chance that the problem could be solved if they went to an expert. At the present time, with IVF, you can say to a couple that you can guarantee that they will have a baby provided they will be persistent in their efforts and provided in special circumstances if they need 
donor eggs or donor sperm or occasionally a donor uterus, they're prepared to accept these. So that uh, the situation is completely different now than it was before IVF. Thinking ahead um, for the next 5, 10, 20 years and beyond, what do you think the future holds for reproductive medicine? Well, uh, it's hard to say, uh, but I think we have to realize that uh, IVF is inefficient on an egg-to-egg -egg basis. And that's grafted on the fact that natural reproduction, when it works, is inefficient also. So we've got a very inefficient process grafted on a no normally inefficient process. Therefore, I would hope that we could greatly improve the efficiency. And the key to that would be some way to identify the fertilized egg that had pregnancy potential so that one wouldn't have to transfer multiple eggs in the hope of getting a single pregnancy. If you knew ahead of time which egg it was that would be one that would produce a pregnancy, you could transfer that. You would greatly improve the end result. You'd do away with the abnormalities that are concerned about and the world would be a better place. Wonderful. Well, that, that's fantastic. I hope that happens. I know you know a lot about Resolve and our history and the kind of work that we do. What advice do you have for Resolve as we continue to work with patients um, on their own family building journeys? Well, Resolve has played a very important role in the infertility story. Um, Resolve was started before IVF occurred and played a very important role in making it possible to talk about infertility uh, out in the open because there was a time at the beginning of the 20th century and even up to mid-century when uh, infertility was talked about in whispers. Uh, and uh, therefore, Resolve has done an immense job because nowadays uh, infertility can be talked about almost anywhere, although there are separate couples who find being afflicted with infertility is a devastating experience. So that there's still a role for Resolve, I think, to uh, have further education. Uh, that's an unending process because there are continually being people brought in to, that need education. Uh, so that uh, uh, information and, uh, and uh, support um, have been the role and I think uh, I see no reason to uh, do otherwise. So I would say Resolve should stay the course. Fantastic. That, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You mentioned how open infertility is and we agreed it's far more open than it ever has been but we still know that so many patients are silent and quiet um, about and, and in many cases shameful about their diagnosis and it, it perpetuates a cycle of silence. Can you um, speak to them and give them any advice on how they should deal with their desire for silence versus being open about their infertility? I always thought it was uh, important in that situation to try to have the patient verbalize and understand uh, why they were silent and concerned. And there are various causes for that. Uh, it may be a cultural matter, depending on the population group from which the patient comes. It may have something to do with religion. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, it can be dealt with and should be dealt with, but it can't be dealt with unless it's uh, openly discussed. So I think uh, like uh, any other uh, abnormality in medicine, if you call it an abnormality, you have to make the diagnosis before you can prescribe the therapy. So I believe that, uh, I think it's true that most physicians uh, feel that their time is best spent uh, doing other things. And so this is where uh, auxiliary help comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, reproductive psychologist or, and, uh, and, and or uh, a support group yep. uh, like Resolve to fit into that particular situation. So there's much to do. We also feel that people with infertility are being ignored. 
uh, we say that word ignored, um, but it can be perceived as we're being ignored by legislators, by insurance companies, sometimes even our own friends and family, and even some in the medical community of, of, of those primary care physicians or others who may not necessarily treat um, that many patients with infertility. So we, we are coming out with a statement that says people with infertility are being ignored. Do you agree with that? Oh, statement? absolutely, absolutely. 